Hello, my name is Lee Orff. I'm a scientist at the University of Wisconsin, and today I'm going to talk to you about the use of lossy compression to enable breakthrough science in cloud modeling. If I could summarize my talk in a single sentence, it would be this. No matter the scale of your numerical simulations, there are only upsides to properly using lossy floating point compression in your modeling workflow because it can reduce your data load by one to two orders of magnitude without changing your scientific conclusions. So you get something for nothing using lossy compression, essentially. As you know, numerical models are used in atmospheric science in many contexts, both operationally and in terms of basic research. And this talk is focused primarily on big research problems that are being conducted on supercomputers, but the same techniques could apply to all sorts of models, even outside of atmospheric science. Lossy compression is a process that works on three or four dimensional floating point data in any, any context. So common practices in our field are to save data periodically. And the period, how often you save data, is chosen before you run the model. Uh, think of it as the frequency or the period. Typically, a typical workflow for uh, a model might be write data every hundredth time step. You know, maybe your time step is a tenth of a second, you write data every 10 seconds. Or your model time step is one second, you write data every one minute. Uh, 60 time steps. So the point here is you're saving only one tiny fraction of the data that's possible to save. And you're doing that because it just takes too much time using normal techniques. So the choice is determined by a lot of things. And it's all specific to your own application. Now, in the research regime on these supercomputers, these big simulations are very expensive. And what I mean by that is um, when the machines are expensive, getting access to them is very difficult. So you really got to utilize your time in that machine, optimize it as much as you possibly can, because all you've got when you're done is the data that you save to disk. Okay? No matter what the scale of your problem, once the model is over, the model's done running, you have nothing but the data you saved. So you want to save as much data as possible under most circumstances, right? Because the more data you save, the more valuable your simulation was. Um, because I always a bottleneck, this can be very difficult. And I'm kind of, this talk is kind of an advocacy talk because I want other people to do this and I'm interested in making it easier to do, um, seeking funding for some, like adding ZFP to war, for instance. But um, part of this is just to say, hey, this is possible. If you're not familiar with lossy compression, it can really help in many ways. So we're using ZFP. It's written by uh, Peter Lindstrom and it is, we're using what's called error bounded lossy compression where you specify the maximum amount of error you are willing to tolerate at any grid point at any time, and you set that value, and the compression algorithm goes out and compresses the data, honors that value, and you get the compression ratio that you get. So you let the algorithm take it from there. Um, it works very well. Um, one of the reasons it works very well is because of, uh, from a recent paper just a few months ago, from CAMS model data, and I'll just quote Kluver et al., most CAMS model data variables contain fewer than seven bits of real information per value and are highly compressible due to spatiotemporal correlation. So not only do you only have about seven to eight bits of useful data, of useful information in your floating point data, your 32-bit floating point data, but those seven to eight bits or whatever can be further compressed to say one to two bits. Hence, you get your, say, 16 to 1 compression ratio, 20 to 1 compression ratio, etc. So that's how it works. Now, that's not how it works works because I'm not going to talk about how the algorithm works. This talk isn't about that. This talk is more, hey, consider using lossy compression if you can because it can reduce your data load by a lot. And that just opens doors to new types of analysis. Um, so I'm I developed something I call it LOFS, lack of a file system. It's comprised of HDF5 files that are ZFP compressed. I'm using the CM1 model to do my science. You could use the same approach with WARF or other, other models. It doesn't even have to be atmospheric models. Um, I took out the IO driver from CM1 and I replaced it with my own. And each the way it works is each node each multi-core node that is running on the supercomputer, and on Frontier we have 56 cores per node, each node run, writes one file. So on each node I collect, collect it into a big bundle and it grows in memory and then when the time is right I send the data to disk. So 
Um, even though there's 56 cores on a node, only one file is written per node. So that reduces the number of files by cramming 50 to 100 times per file. It further reduces the number of files. So you don't end up with too many files. And the files you do end up with are pretty big and really well compressed. So when the CM1 model is done writing LOFS data, this is kind of what it looks like. You have a top directory that's history. Inside that directory, there's a directory called 3D because it's 3D data primarily. And inside that 3D folder, there are a series of, of directories, each of which is noted by the time range over which the data was saved. And within those directories, there's a series of directories. Um, each directory is just a zero padded number uh, in, in intervals of a thousand in this case. That means no one directory will have more than a thousand files in it anywhere. And this is important on supercomputers. If you write too many files to a directory and you've got Lustre as your file system or whatnot, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to overload the metadata servers. Everything's going to be terrible. So if you can, um, if you can keep your files, the number of files per directory to a small enough number, it will make your life much better. So again, this was pretty much done via trial and error, but it, it works, it works very well. And it's, 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 once you get over the technical hurdles, it's really, um, it's, Everything just kind of works. So from the largest simulation I've done, I presented this two years ago at AMS, a 10 meter simulation of a supercell that contains a long track EF5 tornado. This is, um, this is how much data I saved as a fraction of how much I would have saved had it not been compressed at all. So it's kind of like flipping the, uh, flipping the um, compression ratio on its head. So if you have 10% of uncompressed, that's 10 to one compression ratio. So if you look at uh, this diagram, you'll see there's quite a range and notice the top of this diagram only goes up to 60%, not hundred. Um, and if you look at the accuracy parameters I've chosen, some are small, some are big. And I had my own thoughts when I chose these. If you look at DBZ, now that's something that I'm just gonna be looking at. I'm not gonna make calculations from DBZ. So I use an accuracy parameter of one DBZ. That means nowhere in the data where there'll be more than an error of one DBZ in all the data. Well, it turns out the error averages like about 0.01 DBZ across the entire domain. It's just the way that ZFP kind of works. There will be some places where it's closer to that 1.0 threshold, but not very, not very much. So it actually is better than it looks. If you it, really, that 1.0, you're actually better than 1.0 over most places by quite a bit. Same goes for all these. Um, you'll notice there's a range. That's why I'm using box and whiskers because these are files. These are compression ratios of data in files. So depending on where you are in the domain, your compression ratios will be better or worse because there's less going on or there's more going on. In places in your data where there's a lot going on, compression is less efficient it is, or you don't get as, you get bigger files because of the way it works, where there's less entropy, less things moving and changing, then you end up with data that compresses very well. So here's from a 30 meter simulation of the full domain showing uh, the vertical component of vorticity with an accuracy parameter of 0 0.1, which is kind of high for vorticity, believe it or even in a simulation where you have a tornado, where you have like 2.0 is, is like your, your vorticity. But um, that's a pretty reasonable value. It's a little high, but I wanted to show that you get 300 to one compression ratio across your entire domain. If you just decided to save everything, save Zeta and use a 0.1 accuracy parameter, remember you're gonna get accuracy that's more like 0.01 or even more because of the way the algorithm works. You get this kind of wonderful compression ratio. Now that little box in the center there, that's where the action is. That's where the tornado is. That's where the mesocyclone is. So let's actually focus on that box because I'm gonna be saving data in that region frequently, not over the whole domain. And then it doesn't look as impressive because now your subdomain wide compression ratios are more like 20 to one. But that's where the action is. That's where the most, the most interesting stuff is going on. But what's great is that you don't have to worry about picking an effective bit rate. Let the algorithm run the transform and, and, and honor that accuracy parameter and let it worry about all that. You just look at the data or use it, uncompress it and calculate new things from it. It'll be okay as long as you didn't compress it too much. Now, from my perspective, the real test of lossy compression is not so much in the Eulerian data, looking at data, but using lossily compressed data to do trajectory, Lagrangian trajectory analysis, because that is such a powerful tool in our field. So this is work that's being done with, by Kelton Halbert. He's my PhD student. And he has done, this is from a 100 meter simulation 
of a Tornadic supercell. And he has saved data in with using different accuracy parameters, anywhere from 10 to the minus eighth to 10 to the zero. So 10 to the minus eighth, fourth, two, and zero. Quite a range. And for all variables, this is just sort of to look at how it all fleshes out. Now, we're looking at in this diagram, the average parcel position error from a bundle of parcels that is being integrated offline from data saved at the model time step using lossy compressed data. So it's been lossily compressed. And the really encouraging results here, let's say you use an accuracy parameter of one meter per second. Okay, 10 to the zero. That's high, way too high. You really shouldn't use something that large, right? Because that's, that's getting up there. Even if you use an accuracy parameter of 1.0 and you let a bundle of trajectories go, this is going up into the updraft and spreading out into the anvil a bit. Um, that's the ZFP4 line on this diagram. Um, you run for uh, 600 seconds and your average position error is the grid spacing, 100 meters. Okay, the average position error is 100 meters. That's also the grid spacing of the simulation. So think about that's one grid zone, average error using that kind of high compression over 600 seconds of time. 600 seconds of time is, is an infinite amount of time when you're looking at air going into a tornado anyway. So the, accumulate, the air will accumulate over time, as you can see, but really you're probably only gonna be integrating over 60 to 120 seconds anyway to look at like say the SVC or the kind of stuff we're looking at in the cold pool because data stuff's moving fast. So this is really encouraging. Uh, the ZFP3 line there, um, results from data uh, is even more accurate where uh, the average position error is one hundredth of the grid spacing. So one meter as opposed to a hundred meters. Uh, so that's really good. And that data is about seven to one compression ratio for the velocity variables. So we would probably pick something somewhere in between three and four in, in normal practice and, and not worry about it anymore. Why do I do all this? Uh, because the impact from the science uh, can be quite big. On the left, you'll see uh, a BAMS article where we introduced the SVC. We did some trajectory analysis. That was with the Vapor software. That was before we had uh, Kelton's approach. And on the right, a recent paper in Science Magazine. Uh, this is research led by Morgan O'Neill at Stanford University. We simulated uh, supercells that produce above anvil cirrus plumes and discovered that a hydraulic jump is what causes the plume to form. And this hydraulic jump is the result of a very, very thin jet that, um, that results in, in, the H, in the hydraulic jump. And you can see there in the inset figure C there, that is the trajectory analysis, um, offline trajectory analysis at the model time step, both forward and backwards in time to look at the source of the air and where it's going. So as I round things up here, um, I have seen the future and it is highly compressed. <laughs> Um, it, really, as we get to the exascale, we're going to have to take much more care in how we save data. There's nothing intrinsically special about the IEEE floating point standard, and dealing with I.O. head-on can result in some really big benefits. And clearly, uh, compressing data can be done in more fields, and um, it can be applied to many cases beyond Earth and atmospheric science. So I'll pause there and uh, ask for any questions. Thank you.